Hello, my friends, and welcome. Welcome to week three of our April poetry celebration. It's amazing to say week three. We're deep into it now. Let me just remind you in case you think, oh my goodness, we're almost done. We're not really. This is week three. There will be another video for week four, and then there will be a final video in week five where I'll reveal the prizes and get to read some more of your poems. So we're not at the end yet. We're really kind of in the middle, which makes me glad because I am loving Poetry Month and I am loving your poems so much. Thank you everyone who has been sending me poems. Thank you for your continued good wishes. I'm, I'm feeling even better this week than last, a lot better actually. And just thank you for being part of this celebration. It really means so much to me. So I have wonderful poems to read. Uh, again, I would like to read every single poem I get from you. Uh, this week, my printer has finally given up the ghost. And so you're gonna see me sort of holding up my laptop, which is not my favorite way to read, but needs must, as they say. Uh, so we had the, if you might remember that last week, our spark was to write a poem that was in some way inspired by Anthony O'Raftery's poem, uh, Misha Raftery and Filia, Lan Dochish is Gra. I'm Raftery, the poet, full of hope and love. And you wrote some beautiful poems. And the first of the poems I want to read is by a poet who said in a, in a note to me, the poem I am sending you goes along with your challenge of declaring myself as an artist, poet, and musician. I'm looking back on my journey as an artist and feeling love for the young girl, myself, who wanted a much different, a life much different from what was expected of a girl of my generation from a small town. This made me, actually it made me cry a little bit, to be honest, because I love it when we step forward at any point and say, even so. Even though that was the case then, I now am declaring myself the poet that I've always been. So this is Alice's poem, and it's called A Reverie to Spring. The smell of new lavender, the pink and red blossoms of the camellia bush, the happy chirps of songbirds fill me with awe. This spring, I remember a time when my life was a new book, many chapters still to be written, an adventure with unexplored paths spread before me. This spring, in my dreams, I see the faces of old friends and lovers. Do they remember me? Do they know all I have accomplished? Growing up in a small country town, my future could have been a narrow bridge. There was no wealth no appreciation of my pale beauty. The judgments on my prospects were decided while my butterfly wings were still wet. This spring, I look through my high school yearbook, find the page where I was voted most talented in class, a small spark that kept my ambitions alive, the hope of someday unfurling my wings of learning to play a Beethoven string quartet. This spring, I watch a pipe vine swallowtail rest on my salvia bush. I feel the warmth of the sun, the joy of a life filled with love, art, and music. The final chapters are still to be written in my life as an artist. Yes, Alice, yes, yes, a thousand yeses. The final chapters still are to be written in my life as an artist. There are many chapters yet to unfold. That is beautiful. I love the way that the butterfly is woven through the poem. And I love, I, I think it's powerful when we step forward in our own, in our, I was going to say defense, but it's really in our own um, shoring up and claiming and say, Again, even so, even if other people didn't see it, even if I had a humble beginning, even if anything, I still decide right now that this is me, an artist, a poet. Bravo, Alice. 
Uh, some other wonderful claiming poems came in, modeled on uh, Antony O'Raftery's poem. And I'm going to read a couple of, of excerpts by two of my dear friends, Tricia. Uh, the first one, it's called, I am Tricia the Poet. My name is Tricia the Poet, and I live in hope and proffer love. This life is beautiful and also hard, but my eyes are clear and opened wide. My ears are made for listening to you, each and all, and also to the world, and all creatures and nature living in it, to hear what they are teaching. I will carry your burdens and soothe your heart with my words. May it ever be so that the muse visits to fill my pen. And my dear friend, that has been certainly true. The muse is ever with you. And another beloved Tricia writes this. I am a poet. The first poem I ever wrote had a bird, a tree, and a nest. That's all I remember of it. I saved my babysitting money, took the bus to Malden, and bought my first book of poetry. Hardcover, Robert Frost. I didn't understand a lot but I knew it was a land I wanted to live in. And so you have. And I really love, and actually, um, that poem by Tricia gives, I think, there's always, every poem has sparks, right? I'm sure you can tell that uh, right off the bat. You could read any one poem and make up your own spark. I know you do. But that poem, I think, one of the beautiful sparks, you could think about the first book of poetry that you ever had or um, the first inspiring book, however you want to take that, and then write a poem about it. Uh, my friend Kathleen wrote a beautiful poem about grappling with, with poetry, grappling with words, with oppositions. I just want to read you a little bit of it because I just loved this here. I am Kathleen the poet, full of crippling doubt and relentless curiosity who found the cure for both is writing. Crippling doubt and relentless curiosity. What a pair, what a gift they are together. Uh, in the poem, Kathleen goes on to show us that the crippling doubt is mitigated and soothed and helped and uplifted by that curiosity. Curiosity, no matter what, right? We all have those doubts. I sure do too. And curiosity keeps us open to life. So thank you so much for that, Kathleen. Um, Sarah wrote this beautiful claiming poem. I am a poet. These are my songs. I carry them in a basket of reeds. Like the cradle of baby Moses found by Lady Egypt, my big sister, her guide, hidden then found, sorry, hidden then found, in a bird-filled swamp. That's a world unto itself. There's a myth, more than one. Wonderful, so, so great. So if you haven't had a chance to write that claiming poet poem for yourself, you might be glad to do that. I think it's powerful to, de to make that decision to claim who you are as a poet in, in poetry. Uh, my friend Mike just wrote this haiku that I just loved. Listen to the rhythm of it, that the timing is perfect. Snowy egret still waits, waits, patiently waiting. Zap caught the minnow. <laughs> That's so great, Mike. Zap caught the minnow. It's exactly right. Uh, now, this year, for the first time, we have a poem from our Declan. And I know many of you who have been with us through these years of poetry uh, will remember Declan, who was uh, our first young poet to ever participate. And he brings us a poem of gratitude. And this is what it says. I think we should be grateful for the water we have, the sparks that give us fire, and the cows, and then the calves. I think we should be grateful for the birds and also bees. I think we should be grateful for our keys. Declan, I think you are so wise, my friend, and 
you're right. That is so encompassing. If you really think, I, I liked putting that after Mike's egret um, with the water. I think we should be grateful for the water we have. Cows and then the calves, right? The, the, the first thing and then the thing that comes from it. And that could be uh, the people and then the children. It could be the dogs and then the pups. Uh, all of that, that sense of continuity. And then the birds and the bees, right? The, the sense of life around us. And then our keys. I think that's marvelous because you're right. These things in some ways, the gratitude itself is the key. Thank you, Declan. Thank you. Now, his mama also sent a poem and I thought it was beautiful. So she was inspired. There is a, a man who studies myths and stories. His name is Dr. Martin Shaw. And he is uh, doing a new project called The Skin Boat and the Star, which pays homage to the early Christians, especially um, the ones in Ireland. Um, and the skin boat would, would refer to the curragh, the, the, the boat made of wooden laths and then covered with skin. So Anne wrote this beautiful poem called Kismet. It was never about the star. It was about what the star was guiding you to. I am the stranger in paradise. I am the bad wolf. I am hiding in plain sight like you in your skin boat. Attract miracles like the baby attracted animals and magicians. Trust in the unseen is key. As the star may lead you into the desert, it may tell you to sell all your worldly possessions and go fishing. Do not fear the storms, they will pass. Pay attention, dance. Those are great lines, pay attention, dance. Also, we have a key in Anne's poem, trust in the unseen is key. And we can think back to Declan saying, I think we should be grateful for our keys. I want, I love when poems ping off of each other like that. Uh, that happens, I think, all the time and it's so delightful. My friend Angela, who is a beautiful singer, wrote a poem about the eclipse. And there were some poems about the eclipse. I wanted to share with you an, an excerpt. Angela's poem is long and full of beautiful detail but I wanted to zero right in on the end of this poem because it ties together her mother who had died 12 years to the day before the eclipse and her experience of actually witnessing the eclipse in totality. She traveled to do that. So it's called Eclipse Witness in Totality and this is an excerpt. I am praying and contemplating her love. As I witness solar eclipse miracle unfolding, black pupil looking out from our sun, then the silver, sorry, then the sliver of shine remaining. My mother, tearful, smiling back at me just before her spirit left, released, free to soar heavens and earth total engulfment of moon upon sun, dark center black hole, encircled by white light corona, with slight tinge of redness and sparkling sword-like extensions, children screaming in dread mixed with excitement, in sudden darkness stars appearing in mid-afternoon. I join the primal scream, exalted by the wonder of life, this very moment of planetary sun, moon, light exchange until the moon steps aside once more, sun reemerges. I savor once again its life giving warmth. That's beautiful. And again, I think a, a beautiful spark comes from it, which is the idea of weaving together two things that seem to be unrelated, right? Remembering that final moment with her mother uh, and also witnessing the complete eclipse of the sun and then its reemergence. 
it's a powerful weaving together. So wonderful. Uh, I was excited. Kathleen did actually, last week, our dare was to memorize a poem. And if you haven't had a chance, no bother. It's always a good time. And again, a quatrain will do, or a couple of quatrains. Um, Kathleen took on this poem by Emily Dickinson, which I want to read to you and then read her reflection because I really loved what she said. Um, so this is Emily Dickinson. I felt a funeral in my brain. I felt a cleaving in my mind as if my brain had split. I tried to match it seam by seam, but could not make it fit. The thought behind I strove to join unto the thought before, but sequence raveled out of sound like balls upon a floor. Right, we know that feeling of when you just can't make it fit together. Um, Emily made it fit together so often. Kathleen says this, memorizing someone else's work, at least for me, leads to thinking and ultimately seeing a greater depth of their possible meaning and the writer. Amen to that. The closer attention we pay to a poem, the more we return to it, the more, uh, I think a, a great exercise, honestly, is to copy poems out. Nothing will make you look more closely. Even at things, the nuances of, of line breaks and punctuation, which I think is really, you know, the, I assume that the poet has mindfully included everything in the poem. And so to notice those kinds of details can actually unveil another layer of meaning. So finally, our, our last of the community poems this week uh, is by Miriam. And I, I just wanted to share it with you because it's another of the claiming poems, but it ends with you and me. And it's just joyful and encouraging. I am Miriam, the poet. I am dancing with words, with joy. I let the music flow through me. I am more than a tool or a toy. I am the creator I was born to be. Poets must struggle, I learned in the past. Only suffering is worth writing about. Poets die young and they live far too fast. Looking back, nonsense is what I want to shout. Years avoiding empty pages, believing I was fine, far from a waste of time. My mind was growing, stashing away words until I was ready to shine. The time has come, the stream is flowing. Are you inspired? Then join me right now. Let's dance together. I believe you know how. Amen. Yes, Miriam, we are ready to dance. And that brings us right back around in a circle to Alice's poem of claiming, looking back and deciding it's not over. I'm going to have it now. I love that. So I wanted to tell you that I did visit the seventh graders yesterday and it was marvelous and inspiring. And I still feel it today. Uh, many of them, I taught them a little, some of them, uh, I met, I met every kid in the seventh grade or at least the ones who were present. Uh, and for some of them, I taught them about, about Ismisha, uh, Misha Anthony O'Rafferty, our poem that we had last week, and I invited them to say, I am so-and-so, the poet, full of, and to hear them say, I am Aubrey, full of kindness, or um, oh, what was his name, this young boy, can't remember his name, I am Isaiah, I think, full of creativity. It was so exciting and also they were hilarious and ingenious and brilliant and I, I loved being with them so much. I laughed and I I was truly inspired. Over the, the lunch break, I had a little lunch break and I just wrote I in my, this is just another little traveling jour journal that comes along with me, I wrote a really just drafty mess of a poem and I just wanted to share it with you because it's it's from that time. I loved being at this school. It's called The Librarian, and it is for um, Chanel McDaniel, who's the librarian. But I also really want it to be for all the teachers at Belmont Middle School, 
because I was so impressed. True education is going on there. High spirits, growing, everything, everything all at once. Here's my poem. This is just a little poem. The librarian fills the long room with hope, with slogans cut out of shiny paper, with Harry Potter Lego castles on the shelf behind her and a plush headwig soaring over the checkout desk, with books faced out to entice, with games and art supplies in clear plastic bins, with maps, with a pair of paper mache elephant heads, with trugs of markers, with googly eyes and play fangs to make the book drop into a friendly blue monster, with a kind word for everyone, with names and knowing, with hope, as I said, yes, with love. It's not much of a poem, really. And yet I'm, I just, I wanted to share it with you because I, I love writing a poem like that, that helps me go right back to a moment. And so I sat as I ate my, my soup that I brought for lunch and just looked around and felt and felt what was being accomplished in that room. And so I just wanted to share that with you that it's another kind of love poem you might like to write is just taking a moment, noticing like that. So this week I have two poems for you. They're, they're, that I think are extraordinary poems. They're both about fathers and they're really both love poems. Uh, the first I'm going to read comes from this book, How to Love the World, Poems. It's a beautiful, beautiful book full of poems I just know you would like to read. This one is by Laura Ann Bosselar and it's called Bus Stop. Stubborn Sleet. Traffic stuck on 6th. We cram the shelter, soaked, strained to see the bus, except for a man next to me dialing his cell phone. He hunches, pulls his parka's collar over it, talks slow and low. It's daddy, hun. You do? Me too. Ask mom if I can come see you now. Oh, okay. Sunday then. Bye. Me too, baby. Me too. He snaps the phone shut, cradles it to his cheek, holds it there. Dusk stains the sleet, minutes shush by. When we board the bus, that phone is still pressed to his cheek. Oh, <laughs> Make, it, does that get you? What a marvelous poem it is though. What an in, important poem. So that poem, of course, put me in mind of a poem you may have read yourself. Um, this is called Those Winter Sundays and it's by Robert Hayden. And in preparing to read this poem for you, I read a little bit about Robert Hayden. And he was born to a family that had a lot of trouble. And so he was adopted or fostered by the neighbors next door. And they also, they had a, a very uh, difficult family life that he was adopted into. So he really did not have an easy go of it getting started. Uh, and you can hear that in this poem and you can also hear his desire to love. Here it is. It's called Those Winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the warms, what, sorry, when the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere 
and lonely offices. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? That poem published in 1966. That's a master of work, if you ask me. So because of that, I'd love to invite you, if you would like to, uh, a spark. Write a poem in which you witness an act of love or love itself, however you take that. Both of these poems, uh, this poem witnesses from a distance of time the act of love of his, his father did every day in driving out the cold and taking care of his shoes. Laurent Bosselard's poem witnesses the love between a, a father and his daughter and enshrines it in the poem. I think it's really worth doing. I actually think this month of thinking about love has been really, so far, really important for me to just, I'm noticing love everywhere. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So that's your spark. Witness an act of love, yours or someone else's. Uh, a dare. Okay, this maybe you might think this is a crazy dare, but I thought it would be fun to write a haiku of love or encouragement and either give it to someone or leave it somewhere where so in, the, in public, on a supermarket shelf or in the library or at the bus stop where someone else could find it. If you do that, please tell me the story. I definitely want to hear it. So you've got your spark and your dare, uh, if you will. So again, we're getting kind of back on track now. Um, I'll, you know, hopefully have a, a video for you next Monday as back to our usual um, schedule. So if you'd like to send me poems, uh, send the poems by Saturday evening, five, five o'clock, that's the 20th of April, to kate at katechadborn.com. And again, thank you everybody for sending, you know, the poems in the body of the email, no attachments, that's a real help. Uh, remember, we do have prizes. I'm, I'm still working away in my Jumping Fox design uh, journal. Also, we have some some gift cards coming along from Dana Wild of the Positive Mindset for en for Entrepreneurs, Engineers. I'm not an engineer. Uh, it, anyway, the Positive Mindset for Entrepreneurs Club. We are lucky and grateful and grateful to both of our sponsors for being with us and encouraging us to make poems this month. So I think that is all. I hope you will have a wonderful week of making poems and enjoying poems and living in poetry. That's what this is all about. And again, I'm, I'm just so grateful for your company and your encouragement. Uh, please do, you know, leave a comment. It's, it's really lovely. Uh, like the video, that also really helps me just kind of keep the energy up. Share it with somebody. Let somebody else in to poetry. So, Thank you for all you're doing, um, but especially for your good company. And I will see you next week. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye for now.